This is the Demystifying Mental Toughness Podcast, hosted by David Charlton, and you're listening to this podcast to help you build your own mental toughness, or so that you can support other people or your clients better. Either way, you will learn more about developing this plastic personality trait that all but guarantees that you will perform better and lead a more prosperous life. Hi, welcome back to the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with your host, David Charlton. I hope you're well and I hope your week has gone well so far. Today's episode is on a topic close to my heart, golf psychology. Golf is a sport that I've played since I was 10 years old and one of my great passions. And in April, so in another few weeks time, the golf season is going to begin in the UK. And knowing golfers as I do, There's going to be a lot of people getting excited about this now, and they'll likely have purchased a lot of gear, invested in golf lessons in the hope that 2023 is going to be their year. So if you're a golfer, I'd argue that listening to this podcast episode could well help you. I'd also argue that spending some time with a psychologist who knows the game well can also be a big help. You know, working with a psychologist doesn't just have to be for the super elite like a Rory McIlroy or a John Rahm. It's available to anyone, and the results can often be very, very satisfying for the golfer, especially the guy or the girl who doesn't approach us in a panic looking for a quick fix. On to today's episode, though. Well-respected psychologist Dr. Brian Hemmings joins me today, where we chat about his work in the field, the frequent challenges faced by golfers, We also discuss the importance of the relationship between the client and the psychologist, quiet eye training, transitions in the sport and the challenges of switching tours, joining county or national setups and deselections and so on. Here's our conversation. Hi, Brian. It's it's great to catch up with you again. Um, It's been a while now. Um, Would you explain to the listeners a little bit about your your background and your your interest in the psychological side to to golf? Okay. Um, Well, first of all, thanks for the invite, David. Um, I started working in golf in 1997. Well, if you go back to um, to a very potted career history, I was 23. I went back to, uh, uh, to university as a mature student down in Chichester. I did a degree in sports studies. Um. I was very anxious about going back into education because I'd left at 16 with just a handful of O levels. Um, but I, I, I seemed to do well. I got a, a, a first class degree and I got invited to stay on and do a PhD. Uh, and that was in, in, in boxing. Um, uh, and then I got a, 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 a university lecturing role up in Northampton. Um, and I moved up there and around that time, um, England golf, the, the 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 setup for the boys regions they had 10 regions uh and they were looking for somebody to deliver a couple of the regions in the midlands of course i was accessible and i got recommended by a friend and uh worked in these two or three boys regions got, got to know a few coaches and they just seemed to like what i did um perhaps in comparison to the to the person that was that we'd been used at the time and within a couple of years they'd asked me to um take over working with the men's elite squad so first of all, I'm not a golfer. I didn't have any background in golf. I didn't play it as a youngster. I was a, I played football to a reasonable level and, and cricket to a reasonable level, uh, football semi-professionally, but would never have had a professional career in it. Um, and so at that point I was working in boxing, was doing some work in motorsport, uh, and in, in golf and, and in, and in cricket as well to some degree. But the golf work really took off. I, I, I got, was getting invited to do more and more work. Because you meet so many players and coaches within an England setup. Um, so I was still working full time as a, as a lecturer and, and the golf work just grew. And I guess, um, and then I, I, you know, I hosted some golf psychology conferences at Woodall Spa, the National Golf Centre. Uh, and at that time in the, well, I guess in the mid nineties, golf was using psychologists, but it was still really in its infancy. Uh, probably in America, there were, it, it was probably a bit more, a bit, bit more widely used. Uh, and so there was a certain amount of stigma towards psychology at that point as well. But I did find of all the sports I worked in, there was least in golf and they really embraced you. And I guess that was really interesting from a uh, from a practitioner's point of view, because you didn't feel like you were breaking down barriers. You felt that people wanted to work with you. And that was actually really refreshing. Um, so I, I gradually became more and more, I guess, more and more immersed 
in that environment. I was doing lots of days of the year with England Golf in the training um, and competition environment. So I was traveling to competitions abroad with the team. And I guess what happens is, is that even though I didn't play golf as a youngster, um, the more you, the more you become immersed in the sport, the more you understand the technical knowledge, the more, um, the more sport specific, um, expertise you acquire. And then I think it becomes almost a bit of a self fulfilling or it's almost a joke. Sometimes you can't get away from it because that's what your reputation is in. So I wrote a golf book. I did a golf CD. CD sounds really ancient now, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, and I, and I set up a website in something like, I don't know, 2002. And I, I probably think it was the first golf psychology website in the UK at that point. And the, 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 the idea was I was going to sell all these CDs on this website. And of course, well, that didn't quite happen. <laughs> um, it's a little bit more to marketing than that. But no, that's, so it sort of grew and obviously formed really good relationships with players and then players who then turned pro from the England setup. Work, ended up working with them as professionals. And I guess your name and reputation just grows through doing good work. Um, uh, and at the same time, England, England, England women's golf. I've done some work with them around 2000, 1999 to 2001. And then they approached me in 2008 to, again, to take on the sort of lead role with their national squads and, and, and also lead the, the, the girls provision as well. Uh, so I decided at that point to go self-employed and leave the university role. And then I was being self-employed since, although I have got a lecturing role at University of Winchester now. Um, but yeah, um, and been really fortunate to travel around the world. Um, I've done P- uh, coach education in China over the last few years. Really wonderful place, South Korea, uh, Hong Kong. I did three years as their consultant and working with their squads. So I, I, I really, I, I, I supervise sports sites going through and I'm, I've obviously met a lot of people who've, who've been golfers and wanted to uh, specialize in golf. And I, I do stress to them that I didn't set out to become a golf psychologist. I didn't set out with that niche in mind. It kind of the opportunities presented themselves. I enjoyed working in the sport. It's rich. It's rich and fertile for psychology input because of the amount of time people are on the course and the amount of time they play but the amount of thinking time available and of course the variations in the game the ups and downs of the game as well as the kind of normal psychological principles it's a great sport to work in and and actually I've been to fantastic places and the people I've found you know, people I've found to be fantastic and I've really in you know a lot of my work is is I understand that the, the the core of success in in sports psychology is uh, and the research shows us this is is the the impact of the of the professional relationship not just content you know can we say what do you do what do you say and that's all that you know that varies depending on who you've got in front of you but what doesn't change is you've got to have a very strong professional relationship and you've got to work that out with each individual um so the interest in golf wasn't there as a youngster but i came immersed in it through work opportunities it seemed to like what i did and I guess then it triggered my interest in terms of um, publications. And, and I've been asked, obviously, to be involved in academic publications as well um, with different researchers, which has been really, really nice as well. Um, so, yeah, so that that's a sort yeah. of a pot, potted history, David. <laughs> Excellent. Do you, do you play the game at all now or, or not? Um, very badly. Uh, no, I did. I did have a spell um, when I was working up at New There was three of us at work and we used to go and have a, a, a knock about on a on a Wednesday afternoon, you know, that was, in, you know, when student sports taking on. Um, and at one stage, I did joke when I was with the England squad, I had a long game coach, I had a short game coach, I had a putting coach, I had a physiotherapist. <laughs> and that, that was just a sort of in joke within the squad. Um, I had, I had these, I had this wealth of experience in my coaching, my team, but, um, let's just, let's just say my talent didn't grow. <laughs> no, and, and, and be perfectly honest, I did, I did like playing, but wasn't proficient and, and, in all honesty as well, because I was working so much in it, when I got free time, I didn't really want to be at a golf club. And also I had young children and, you know, it's just, it's a time, con- it's time consuming. Mm-hmm. Um, but I love the golf environment when I work. It's a lovely place to be of all the places sports psychologists can, can work. And of course it isn't all outside, but you know, walking around golf courses. Yeah, it sounds horrible. There's, yeah. There, there's harder things to do. You know, it's, uh, you, 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 you develop your leg muscles, put it that way. <laughs> but yeah. no no it's been a it's it, it, it's a it, you know it's a wonderful sport to work in really is 
Yeah, I mean, it's a sport I've played played in since I was for what about ten years old. So yeah, really, I'm like really keen on on getting into the into the topic a little bit more. I'm just wondering there. You, you talk about the there was less stigma involved even what twenty years ago. Do you, when, when you look at how maybe golf psychology has evolved over that that period, um, what you know, what changes have you seen? Uh, well, it's certainly the wealth of literature. I mean, I, I've got a book, David. I bought at auction. I was I I became a sort of an avid collector of sort of antique golf books, if you like. And the earliest one I bought was 1923, um, uh, Golf and the Brain by uh, an experimental psychologist in Liverpool. And it's a remarkable, the prose is quite funky because it's 1920s, but it's remarkable how similar the, what they're talking about, blank mind theory, you know, playing with a, you know, without thoughts. Um, yeah. It's a classic. Um I think the first book is a 1922 book in the States. I've never got hold of a copy of that. But then there's books came through in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And then, but, but I say to people now of all the sports, sports psychology, obviously you get the theory and research books in sports psychology. But if you go to sports specific, there, there's, I mean, Rotella's what him and Bob Cullen have written about 10. Yeah. Um, but there's just uh, so many. The, 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 the library on golf psychology is immense. But there wasn't any, there wasn't really any stigma. You had a, occasionally, of course, some individuals would be a bit hesitant or a bit unsure. But I think they recognized more than other sports sometimes the psychological demands of the game. They felt that and, and realized that that was a key part of trying to be successful, of managing your emotions on the golf course, of, of how quickly your confidence can go in golf. And how quickly it can return. Um, so having sort of rich, proper relationships in golf, of course, infused me as well. So I, I don't know about seeing it really develop. I just think it was, it was in this country, certainly. I think it was far ahead of the other sports in terms of acceptance of, of psychological input at a time where other sports were maybe, were maybe much more guarded and, um, um, less receptive. Yeah. Have you noticed the like different sort of tools, techniques have changed and the maybe the introduction of technology, brain training and things like that? Um, a, a little bit, I guess. I guess in terms of there's um, various apps, uh, you know, you, you, you've got more, I guess. Um, I, I'm careful not to be cynical, but, you know, there's, there's the, the sort of saying of, of um, old wine in new bottles is you know there's a lot of things that are professed to be sort of new and actually well they're not that new they're just variations of things that have been done before and that's you know that that's fine um um but i don't think things have really changed yes you know we've got various other um psychological approaches coming in over the last i don't know the last five to five years or more in terms of something like act uh, as a sort of a third way third wave psychology but to me, you know, they're just different approaches. And yes, you, as a practitioner, you know which approach you take. But, but again, I think, again, to come back to the relationship, I think sometimes that's, that's, it can be people just too interested in technique where, you know, again, I'm much more firm believer it's content and process and they're very much interrelated. And the key thing is the relationships you form with people. One thing I would say, actually, coming back from coming back to techniques, is I've done a lot of work on quiet eye, you know, in, in, from Joan Vickers in, and I, I, I started, I, I sort of stumbled across that. Um, that was through experiential knowledge of working with players on putting greens and seeing them behave differently in practice to what they did in competition, even how they set up their practice. And I started to, you know, you observe people and you start to put things together about what they do different. You observe what they do differently. And I remember doing a workshop for a load of PGA coaches up at the Belfry. I can't remember what year it was. And I was talking about use of the eyes and things. And the guys, one of the coaches said to me, oh, you're talking about this thing. And I kind of puzzled what, what you're on about. And he said, oh, it was in Golf Digest, uh, something called Quiet Eye or something. And I hadn't come across it at that point in the literature. I remember, I, think I, might, I, wasn't, I was out of, I'm not sure if I was self-employed by that time. But anyway, I started to look into it. And I've done a lot of work in that. And I'm not one to exaggerate the impact of a psychologist most of the time it isn't transformative most of the time it's a slow progressive change you're looking for with lots of bumps on the way just like it is in in technical development or uh, or physical development but i have found with quiet eye 
particularly on short puttings, that can be almost a bit of an eureka for some players. Getting them to do that properly, and you, you can see very quick changes in people in terms of their performance. And, of course, missing short parts can add a significant amount of shots to your round. So yeah. something, which, something which is deceptively, looks deceptively simple, and yet we know if we work in golf, it can be very, very tough because of the expectations and, and, and so on. But I have found that to be very, very impactful. So I would say from my early days of working in golf to what my work might have evolved to look like, in a practical sense, I'd be doing a, 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 a lot of that and utilising quiet eye sometimes as well in terms of other aspects of the game, in terms of long game, where people get, oh, I'm talking about very, very good players here, where they become overly technical and sort of tie themselves up in knots mechanically because they're thinking so much about movements that they underperform. And so I, I do a lot more work, I would say, on use of your eyes and use of vision. So where do you look and for how long? Kind of typical kind of quiet eye gaze control stuff uh because i found that's that's actually much more impactful quick and quicker than kind of the other more standard cognitive approaches do you want to just tell the listeners a little bit more about how that actually works the 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 quiet eye stuff uh well i guess it in in, in simple in putting all it is is in, in target related activities it's it's where does one put their gaze what do they look at and at key points and for how long during the execution of a skill. So in putting, for example, when people are, let's say, they're nervous or anxious or unsure, if you put some eye trackers on, they look down at the ball, you'll see that their vision is sort of scattering about. They're not really focusing on one point. So if you say where you are looking, they'll sometimes say, I'm not sure, or they'll say, I'm looking at the ball. And I say, well, where on the ball are you looking? And actually, the, the, the research tends to suggest it's the top or the back of the ball. Anecdotally, I'd say with the best players I've worked with, they always say the back of the ball. I always focus on the back of the ball. And I say, why do you, why do you look at the back of the ball? And I say, well, that's where you're going to make contact with it. And so it's obvious, but a lot of players don't. They're thinking so much. They follow the, they follow the putter face backwards. They're looking at their hands. They're thinking about their shoulders. And actually, they lose sight of the target at key moments. So it's to focus on a very simple thing, the back of the ball. And then what you often find with players is they'll, they'll track the ball off the face. So because the hole is near, they want to see if the ball goes in. I want to see the result because I want to know if this goes in. Often out of anxiety, some of the best players as well would say they want to look out of keenness. But of course, they think they're looking after the ball has gone and it's left the club face. But if you put cameras on them, the ball is still in contact with the club face when they're starting to move. And of course, as soon as you start to move your eyes, other things start, your head starts to move, shoulders start to move. So then they blame they they think it's technical, mm. but actually it's a psychological thing. It's that I want to look at the result. So coaches would often emphasize, keep your head still. And I'd say, no, don't keep your head still. Because if you're thinking about keeping your head still, your attention is on your head. You want your attention on the ball. And how, what sort of drills would you give a, a golfer to, to be able to uh, overcome that? Well, first of all, I just give a lot of verbal commands about very clear in the direction. I'm only going to change, work on two things. I'm going to get you to focus on the back of the ball. And I want you to fact, when they get a hang of that, then I get them work on them, keeping their eyes still in contact and, and sort of give them a rough idea about, OK, where should you pick up the roll of the ball? If you if you keep your eyes still, there should be a slight dwell before you track the ball. So you might li- m- miss the first couple of feet of the part and to get a feel of that. It, but remember, it's experiential because once they start seeing I'm talking about people who are technically proficient. They'll see the ball go in the hole. And of course, the way our nervous system works is, is it, although this feels unusual to keep my eye still, well, bloody hell, the result is this is going in the hole an awful lot. So then you don't have to say trust it. You just let them experience it. Yeah. So I give a lot of verbal commands, keep your eyes still. And then and then I say, uh, kick back of the ball. And then I say, keep your eyes still at contact, just still and just let them do that. Sometimes, you know, you can get little um, ball markers that they can press in. And I say, as soon as you see the ball, you know, put the ball on top of that. As soon as you see the ball marker, then you can look because the yeah. ball's gone. But then you, obviously you can't do that in a round. So you have to take the training away. So people, often the best players will say they'll look for the, they'll look for the grass where the ball was or they'll look for the shade where the ball was. And when they've seen that, they know it's... And of course, realistically, David, with, with pressure and competition, it's one of those, one of those truisms. It's, it's easier said than done. 
because the, the, the because the the, the the urge to look is so intense, but the best players do it. And as you say, it can, it can be trained, though, which is which is fantastic. It can be trained. And so what you, when you say about, what you're thinking about when you say about what's mental toughness is so broad, but there's an example of mental toughness is the ability to distill doom very, very fundamental, simple things when it will feel like it's very hard to do that, where I want to search for something else. Uh, that's, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to talk about quiet time because it, for the readers, oh, sorry, for the listeners who don't know a lot about it, and I encourage them to read about it and maybe a very practical article. Uh, and, and I've always found, and, and I know the guys at Exeter, Mark Wilson, Sam Vine, do some excellent research. And it's laboratory based, and and some of the, of course the art is taken from the science into, uh, you know, when they talk into quiet eye about how long you should keep your eyes still for. My experience with golfers is they tell you f off because it's not practical. Hmm. So I've had to learn ways of getting them to keep their eyes still for a certain periods of time without thinking about time. Yeah, will you f- you'll find different individuals or will have different preferences as well. Yes, exactly, and some people count. Some people count, just go one, two. And it's fine. I I'm say there's no set way. It's working with an individual to work out how will they achieve that. Um, but as I say, of all, I'm, I'm not, I, I've never been one to overemphasize the potential, you know, you'll get a 10% gain in performance or 20%. That's, to me, that's a bit, of, you know, that's rubbish. Yeah, it's um, a lot of sales, you sort of market. Yeah, it sells it, but, 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 but that is something where I've, through personal experience, I've seen, Actually, some very, very quick changes in people with that. And, and I remember some classic ones. I remember, of course, it, it's not just the result. I remember working with an England golfer who's on tour now. I won't say his name. And he was talking about fast downhill putts. And obviously, the anxiousness of, I'll get this ball rolling. And it's, where's this going to end up? And we were doing a bit of, we were doing some quiet eye stuff. And he turned around and he said, Brian, he said, that's incredible. He said, I've got no more shit in my head. <laughs> You know, you know, so it's there. You know, this is this is acad- isn't academic. You're working with real players who, uh, yeah. So I think I enjoy the quiet stuff because it's 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 in, it, it's it's impactful. And um, now, as you say, the most golfers do get caught in that trap of overthinking, don't they? Where their their mind is just so so active and the they're analysing their technique and that they're, they're either in the past or they're, they're in the future. Yes, exactly. And that's a really good point you made there, because I say, you know, they'll say about being in the past or in the future, and I say, quiet eye, if you keep your eyes still during a part, you are staying in the present moment there. Because if once you start looking, you're looking for the future before you've even finished yeah. this bit. And so, so there's a classic example of how you can do that. Um, which so thanks for raising that. That's a good point. In terms of other like mental blocks, come fears that you know golfers bring to you. What 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 springs to mind? Mm, well, I guess if, I mean, this is the classic response, but it depends because everyone's individual. It, t- it changes at different points in their careers. You know, I, I, my, my often saying with players is, as you overcome one challenge, you'll reach the next challenge, but you won't get to that next challenge unless you come to this challenge. Mm. So uh, you you get confronted with something that you'll think you're that is going to be terrible, difficult to master, but and then the next thing, but you wouldn't have had that if you hadn't done the first one, you know. So you know, I, I've tended to work with more elite players, so things like transitions, you know, transitions from elite amateur to to professional, you know, and that's a you know, it's a tough gig. There's only a certain amount of spots in any one in any one period where there's a, you know there's stacks and stacks of very 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 good players who've not established professional careers and yet they're terrific players that's just the you know so that there's those sorts of challenges there's there's clearly things like when people's confidence is really really low uh, and gets to the point where they don't really want to play because they just don't know where the ball's going to go yeah. and um you know if you're working with people and that's their career then that's a pretty desperate desperate yeah, place desperate yeah, place um desperate place to be in um it, it could be terms... a mix I guess it can be a mixture david it can be a mixture you know when i when i sit down with people for a first meeting or whatever you, you, you kind of assess what what people's needs are and and sometimes it can be a very a practical thing or say you know it's my putting and then maybe something like we've just talked about would in quieter would be might involve me in shots or and then sometimes it's more, i guess it, yeah it's just more classical psychology work of 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 negative thinking, low confidence, doubt, um, frustration. I wouldn't say there's any 
you know, you know I, I guess classic things, concentration, um, regulating arousal, you know, under pressure or, or, or not dwelling on mistakes. I think, you know, when you work in a sport for a long time, you kind of, you hear all these things before. You think, oh, I'll, I'll, I recognize this. You don't make assumptions, but I recognize the pattern of what's happening here because you've heard it from different players before. But what I always recognize is everybody is different and their own experience is different and it will show itself in some way. And where the sports science books say they give general principles and they say, but you've got to individualize thing and they don't tell you how to individualize it. They just say you've got to individualize it. But to me, that's the richest of the work of getting to know the person, the relationship and through the relationship. You find the individual way. So when you when you describe the the various different challenges there, be it the the amateur like transitioning to the tour to the the frustrations, making mistakes, etc. It it I suppose to me it, it sounds quite simple in that people just get really caught up by external factors, don't they? Um, and the the whole the very simple thing about focusing on the process and things you can control is is such a, a big factor it does i think it comes down to this i kind of think there's two central pillars there's you know what you can what you can control or you can't control and um, getting people very very clear on that and also process and outcome often the work comes down to those two things focus on the process and again i can't control the outcome and that's sometimes that's quite a big shift for people it's not saying to you don't want to win. It's just really saying actually helping them to understand that 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 is actually can be counterproductive. But equally, there are some players actually the 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 the, the, you, the drive to win. You don't want to dampen that. It's, yeah. But it's not. But it, so for those sorts of players, it's not dampening it. It's more. It's also educating them about processes too. Because golf's a game where, remember, as a pro, you can go five years without winning quite easily. Um, win, winning is such so elusive because of the depth of the fields and and the, the quality of the fields that you know you, you you can have a very successful career and and win hardly ever. I suppose Ian Poulter would be the classic example where people have talked about him in the in the Ryder Cup and how he just you get the emotion gets to him and obviously the the, the it's all about winning us essentially to him. Whereas yeah, on a on a PGA Tour or well live tour now, um, it's a slightly different um, mindset. I'm sure he's got. Yeah, I guess the other thing that comes to mind is is what I often I feel I often talk to players about is they they fear playing poorly and what if. But I I I think it often boils down to I say to them you're 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 not fearful of playing poorly. You're fearful of the consequences of playing poorly. And often that is where they get into well I I I um I I'll lose money I won't return my card if I don't return my card I'll drop down the tours and then I'll drop down the tours and then. In the end, I, I, I've got no other career. What I do, and they, and they, you, you demonstrate to them that their thinking is like three years ahead. Well, hold on a minute. You're playing. You know, you, well, you can have a bad day at the office. That's fine. And so, helping people understand that it's not failing. Or, and I, I'm really careful with the word failure because I think failure is a media word uh, where they use it. Success and failure. It's very binary and arbitrary. And I try and get players to redefine what failure is to them. That you can play poorly. You might miss a cut. You might not return your card, but that doesn't necessarily you decide what failure is. Yeah, yeah. Because then you can you can minimise that the fear of it. Um, because I think it's actually my experience is that 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 word is really damaging to people. I've worked with a lot of young people who present with this teenagers, uh, and sometimes I'm very direct with them, and I look them in the eye and I say, "You will never be a failure. You might not you might not do all you want to do." But I'll tell you one thing, you will never be a failure. And often I feel they've never heard that. Yeah, it's that story you build up in your own head about failure, isn't it? Essentially, is the, the thing there and what, how you what, think. What, what people will think of me, will I let them down, all those sorts of thoughts that, that are part of the human condition. And and I think particularly for young people, they're looking for reassurance that, that I don't need to be concerned about that. So essentially... It, you talked about the the people skills element to to this role. Golf is a is a very lonely sport, isn't it? So yeah, just having someone to to talk to and get this off your chest actually is yeah is is so vital. Yeah, I, you know everybody has a different different needs. You know, I've worked with some people. I work with them their whole careers, and 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 the next player you might work with once or twice. You you never really really know, and and often it depends what sort of support system they've got. 
outside of that as well. So, for instance, you know, if, if they've got if they if they're married or they've got, they might actually get a lot of that social support or that their the, the needs met in that regard through other people. You know, everyone's different. Some people, you know, and I, I, I and I think some people are very psych. I'm saying this to a girl for the other day. I used to work with many years ago. He's in America now. We're having a chat. We're more friends now, actually. But he was thinking about the work we did, and I said, "Bill, you you know, remember you were very psychologically minded. You know, you, your lens, the way you see the world, is very much psychology driven. You'll get the next player, and they're very technically minded. Yeah. And the, the the route to su- success, if you like, is just well, I've just got to go in it balls and so there's no one set way and again within the relationship you're trying to work out what are somebody's needs some people need a lot of social support some people just want to chat and and others want to work on specific skills and you're trying to i guess just whatever's in front of you you know yeah work with work on work 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 with them um yeah no that makes a lot of sense well what what uh, key takeaways we come up with three key takeaways for the listeners um based on our conversation you know what, what would they be maybe if you if you let's term it for the for the coach who, oh, for the who coach. To, yeah. yeah who wants to su- support their players the, the best they possibly can uh I, I don't want this to sound really um just take time to listen a lot of players just want to be listened to and you can players can rock up for a lesson and it can be that formulaic Right, I'm going to hit balls. Let's go and hit balls, and and actually that might not really be what's needed. And coaches, PGA professionals have a lot of status with players. You know, they've played the game, they understand the psychology of the game. So I would say coaches make time to listen because they can do a lot of good work just by listening. It's not just listening. Often you can help player reach their own solutions and normalise perhaps anxieties or difficulties. Uh, it's not just about swinging the club. Um, remember mentally, and I've done a lot. Of, we didn't, we haven't touched upon this, but I, often in England golf, people used to say, "Oh, you know, what was your best work?" And individuals, and I'd say, "Look, I did a lot of good work with individuals. That I'm very proud of, but the biggest impact I had was on the environment where I worked with the coaches and through the coaches, and together we created an environment of excellence where players weren't afraid of trying, and they competed against each other, and there was challenges." And we, the way we set up practice, I was often helping the coaches say, how can we make this more competitive? How can we make more psychology in this? And Graham Walker, for example, was excellent in the national coach. He's Tommy Fleetwood's coach now. He was ahead of his time in some of the practice challenges he was doing. I said, I remember he set me out all these booklets in his room in the hotel at Woodall's Bar. And I said, Graham, you should, there's about four books here. And I said, there, and, and, he, and Graham just thought, oh, this is great because I'm challenging him. I said, there's so much psychology in this. You know, it's like one ball approach. There's a score in it. They've got to write that down. There's there, there's a competition involved in it. They, they've got to go through a psychological process. Uh, it was so rich. Yeah. And so I, I, I think, so I'd say the second thing was take time to listen, uh, structure practice and skills challenges. You don't have to do this formula. Like I'm sitting down doing psychology. A lot of psychology can be taught through doing. So in other words, you've got to concentrate. You've got to use your routine here. If you start off a skills challenge and it doesn't start well, what are you going to do? You're going to rip it up and say, I'm not doing it today. You've got to deal with adversity. Just like on the first tee, if you hit it OB, you've got to get on with it. Yeah. And equally, if you've got some momentum in golf, I know players that get scary. I'm going low today. People start getting cautious. So the skills challenges can teach them those, can evoke those same emotions and you can learn to deal with them. Um, and maybe the final one was just, and, and this comes from a guy called Ken Revisa. You'll be familiar with his work, probably, David. He he's, he died now. He's a very um, famous sports psych in America. Worked a lot in baseball, not so much in golf, I don't think. Um, he would have been around the same time, around the same age as Rotella, maybe a little bit older. But uh, I think it was a, Roos, a, a, a Theodore Roosevelt quote that he said in sports psychology that. People won't care what you know until they know what you care, that know that you care. They won't care what you know until they know that you care. So again, that relationship side. And I think that's, that's what I've tried to embody, not get over involved, but show I care that I'm invested, that this isn't just a financial transaction. I am paid for what I do and I need to get paid. It's my job, but it means more to me than that. And equally then that, um, I think coaches can, the best coaches, I I remember my book in 2007, 
But I interviewed Pete Cow, and you know everyone knows Pete Cow. He knows golf, one of the probably most famous coaches in the world. I interviewed Pete, and Pete said, he said, I'm like a hairdresser, a woman's hairdresser. He said people just get comfortable. And that that might be, I don't know, that might be deemed sexist. He wasn't meaning in that way, but he was saying is, I want people to just chat to me. And he said, and I said, the last question, if anybody ever reads that book, I said, what's the difference? And he said, I care. Now people sense that. Yeah, yeah, very, you know, very wise words. They're going to feel yeah, respected and valued, aren't they? As a so you can say that you can say the same things to two players. If a player really knows you care, that lands. Yeah. If it if it just comes across that you're giving them some spiel because you're getting paid to give them some spiel, they see right through you. Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes makes a lot of sense. Would you, Would you agree that Stephen Rolnick's work and motivational interviewing also, I mean, this ties in with some of the things you've mentioned, is is certainly a really good read for for the yeah yeah listeners. yeah yeah. I mean, I anything. I encourage people to read and 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 get a, a handle on lots of different approaches because eventually, as if you're in a sport a sports site or a coach, you've got to work out your way of doing it, your way of delivering it, and that's going to be different from other people. Just like athletes play their game in a different way. If you own it, then you'll come across with more assertiveness, more authority, but in a good way. So I would say you can read these things. They might not suit you, but you know about them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, so yeah, Brian, whereabouts can the listeners find you or get in touch with you uh, if they want, you know, if they want to have a conversation? Um, well, my website is www.golfmind.co.uk. Uh, I have another website for sort of um, some other coaching work I do and that's uh www.bjhconsulting.co.uk Brian John Hemmings um so that would be but by email uh emails addresses are on that are on that too there's also um I will give a plug now I've got the chance do you remember the pro do you remember the program shameless David I do <laughs> yeah so I used to like shameless so a bit of shameless publicity here I, I there's a online golf psychology course I, I wrote some years back that's proved very popular around the world golfpsychologycoaching.com if anybody's interested in doing that go on the site and email me and I'll send them a promotional code I'll call the promotional code David Charlton there you go <laughs> I'll have to sign up with my name then <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah that's fine I'll, I'll put all I'll put all the, the details in the in the show notes so yeah hopefully you'll you'll sell a course or two on the back of this as well <laughs> well we'll see we'll see yeah but, um, no, thanks for the invite it's been really nice reconnecting with you yeah no likewise I've, I've really enjoyed it and yeah thank thanks for the the insights you've, you've shared with the listeners yeah enjoy that conversation you know Brian alluded to the old adage of a problem shared is actually a problem halved. And this emphasized to me the importance of the relationship between the practitioner or the coach and the client, certainly the golfer in this case. It's one of the big, big challenges in our role. Often golfers and coaches' personalities can lend themselves to just wanting practical solutions to doing, 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 and also some quick fixes, where often the power of the relationship can really help the golfer simply to deal with emotional responses to the stressors that they're facing. This is actually called in sports psychology, emotional focus coping, where through using skills associated with motivational interviewing or counseling, you, the practitioner, you're trying to help the client reduce, eliminate, or simply tolerate emotional responses to these stressors. And let's face it, in golf, emotional control Being able to handle stress and pressure is so important because of the the link with your fine motor skills. Now, when a golfer moves from a challenge tour to a European or a DP World Tour, lots of things change in their life and many get distracted by external factors, thinking about prize money or worrying about money or placing too much emphasis on their rivals that they compete against. Simply being there, listening, being a sounding board can be a big help. Often though, when things go wrong and perhaps the golfer has a difficult start to life on this tour, they chop, they change caddies or coaches, they implement swing changes, messing around with technique, and they get away from actually doing the basics well that they've always done and that's actually got them to the level that they're at. Sometimes an understanding ear can actually be the thing that that goes on to help them. Some players 
have that in their team and in their personal lives, whereas others don't. So my question to you, whatever level you play at, do you feel isolated on your journey? Do you feel listened to by your team? Does your team enhance your self-worth and make you feel good? If not, this is where we as a sports psychologist come in very useful and where we provide trusted confidential space as well as being able to help you consider your practice and training habits and on-course behaviours so that you can go on to excel. Feel free to get in touch if you're looking for a boost ahead of this coming golf season. My email address is info at sport-excellence.co.uk. I hope you have a great week and if you don't get in touch, have a fantastic golf season. If you enjoyed this episode of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with David Charlton, do check out my website, sport-excellence.co.uk and my online sports psychology resources. Sport-excellence website has essential resources for anyone looking to build their own mental toughness or the mental toughness of their athletes or teams or if you want to achieve peak performance more often or optimal functioning. The Sport Excellence website has everything you need to keep moving forward and thrive. So go on, head over to sport-excellence.co.uk to find out more.